we made a pact <laughs> somewhere sometime in the mid 80s we said we are going to spend new year's eve 1990 not 2000 but 1919 under the eiffel tower come what may welcome to cold war conversations as threats and counter threats go on over the torn city the iron curtain running through berlin has today become a cement wall astonishing news from east germany where the East German authorities have said, in essence, that the Berlin Wall doesn't mean anything anymore. The wall that the East Germans put up in 1961 to keep its people in will now be breached by anybody one who wants to leave. The German people awoke this morning as one nation, celebrating the end of 45 years of division and Cold War. Towns and villages across East and West celebrated the final moment of unification. While in Germany's historic capital, Berlin, a freedom bell pealed at midnight and fireworks lit the night sky over the Brandenburg Gate. In 1986, East German student Anscher met a British guy who was installing sewing machines in the hosiery companies in East Germany. Unusually, he was given quite a bit of freedom to socialise locally and he eventually asked Anscher to marry him. However, with her prospective husband being a citizen of the capitalist West, the process was far from simple. Now, talking of the capitalist West, I'm sure you know that some of our fans are helping the podcast financially via Patreon. So if you'd like to join this select band, then head over to coldwarconversations.com slash donate. Plus you get the sought after Cold War Conversations Coaster 2. Now, back to today's episode. Ancha describes her early life in the GDR and how romance blossomed between East and West, despite the best efforts of East German bureaucracy to thwart the Union. Now, the story does have somewhat of a twist towards the end, so make sure you keep on listening right the way through. We recorded our chat at the Barbican Centre in London, so excuse any background noise, but I'm delighted to welcome Ancha to Cold War Conversations. Okay, I am here with Ancha, who uh, has, without doubt, an interesting story that I think the Cold War Conversations listeners will be uh, interested in. Welcome to Cold War Conversations, Ancha. Thank you, Ian. Lovely to be here. I hope I'm not going to bore you with my story. I don't think so at all. I try my best. At all. So if we can just start off with when and where were you born? Well, I was born um, in 1965 in a small town in the south of what used to be East Germany um, in an area called the Erzgebirge. Stolberg, it was called. Um, Yes, so 1965 Stolberg. Okay, and who who was in your family? It was initially just uh, my parents. I was the first born. I had a younger brother that was born three and a half years after me. Okay, and your parents, what, what did they do? My dad um, comes from an unusual, uh, well, for us it was quite an unusual background, somewhat privileged Um his parents had owned, or his family had owned, a factory um, locally, and that had been um, nationalized in the 70s, but he was still working in it as an engineer. He had studied engineering. Um, he was still working in there. It was quite strange because for us it started off as a sort of a playground because we also lived within the the compounds of the of the company and we had a flat in there in the sort of administrative building and it turned out for a sort of a playground for us um they gradually scaled that back and we weren't allowed in there anymore but my dad was still working in that uh company and my mum was the secretary to our mayor our local mayor um she had done secretarial uh, college and all I I remember her all my lifetime 
or my childhood being the secretary to our mayor. Different mayors, same secretary. Right, right. So that was us. Right, and, and when the factory was nationalised, were you still allowed to live in the flat within the complex, or did you have to move? Yes, we were, because, um, yes, initially it was partially uh, nationalised, um, and when it got fully uh, nationalised in the 70s, we lost some privileges, like a telephone line, which we had always enjoyed, which was very, very unusual for East Germany. Getting a, a, Having a, a private telephone line was just the privileged few that enjoyed that. Um, but somehow we were allowed to rent, to continue renting the, the space that was that we were occupying in that administrative building. I'm not quite sure now you're asking me. I'm not quite sure why that was. But yes, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah. You, were t- you were telling me an interesting story a moment ago about um, the, uh, the factory being shipped, the machinery of the factory being shipped to the Soviet Union. At the at the end of the war, That's which right. obviously you weren't around for, no, but you no, saw I've family only ever photos. Seen, I've only ever seen family photos of that. Yes, my grandparents um, owned the factory, which was a hosiery factory initially. Um, and after the war, we got occupied, obviously, by the Russians, um, and they dismantled the whole factory and there are pictures of big crates of machi- machinery that was shipped off it said in obviously in Cyrillic letters Leningrad on the side of those boxes that were shipped out from our um, local train station um, and rumor has it they never even arrived in Leningrad I don't think they ever were put to any good use after they were shipped out but yeah my my grandmother and her brother, they faced like an empty shell of a factory, which then got turned into semiconductor business. It was partially still privately owned, and my grandmother's brother remained managing director for a while. There was also, oh, there was also <laughs> in, in, in the 70s, no, in the 60s, there was actually a, a play about my grandmother's brother who was running this factory it was called a thoroughly modern man or something along those lines because he had changed from being a capitalist to um, helping the socialist restructuring of eastern germany and he was played by some actor or another um, i have always looked i've been trying to look for it i thought in the age of you know, um, the internet. I would find it somewhere, but I've never found that it. That was going to be my next question, is who, <laughs> who wrote it and where can I find I, it? You know what? I don't know. I'll put the call out to the listeners. They're a, uh, a diligent band. They might be, they might be able to track be, it down. That would, be, that would be so wonderful if I could ever see that. Well, we'll, see, wondered about we'll it. see what we can do there. Thank you. Um, the next question I had is, what were your neighbours like? But it sounds like you didn't necessarily have any direct neighbours, no, or did you? No, we didn't. Uh, we lived in this administrative building. It was my family, and then above us, uh, well, my family, and until 1972, next door, I had my grandmother in a little flat, and upstairs, her brother, who enjoyed a big, um, big flat, um, because they had basically taken my my dad grew up in a big villa that had been built by my great grandfather um, to a replica of something he saw in Monaco, very tastefully, um, and they obviously got that got taken away from my my dad's family and they got relocated into this uh, administrative building and therefore we all sort of lived in there um, all through my childhood until the 80s when they were eventually um, asked to move out right right so yeah that there was no direct neighbors as such yeah yeah and what what was your schooling like i mean what what was your favorite subject my schooling was i i still believe although um, some might disagree with me. I still think that schooling in East Germany was actually quite good. Um, we enjoyed quite a broad curriculum. It was obviously 
it had its limitations, certain things I didn't really like teaching and certain things I taught too much, such as um, ideological indoctrination. But um, we got a, a, a good general um, grounding, I think. Um, I was a very diligent student, I've got to admit. That's um, good to hear. <laughs> um, so I always did well at school and... Um, I also got the opportunity to move on to what was called a Weiter to Oberschule, which was essentially the for, um, gymnasium where you could, what, the, what in, in the rest of Germany would have been called Gymnasium, which basically gave the opportunity to, get, to do A-levels. Um, right. And that's what I eventually moved, where I am eventually moved to do my A-levels. Okay. Okay. And what was your favorite subject favorite at school? Favorite subject was probably all the humanities, history, German, literature, language, art, music, not so much. I yeah. can't sing for tough. And, and history must have had a particular slant, though. <clears throat> yes. History did... Uh, uh, I, I very much enjoyed the early history, which was not um, politically flavoured, or not as much anyway. Um, later on, I mean, history in after the war became, or even between the wars, became quite tedious because it was very, very, um, very ideological. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I can imagine. So... So... Um what were your favourite TV shows as a child? Oh, we had the, um, for all I can remember, we had the opportunity to watch West German television. There was a period of my childhood when that wasn't possible, but you might have come across this, but um, the little um, communities in East Germany would basically club together to uh, club together to get a big aerial on some sort of elevation in the community which would pick up west german television i wasn't aware of that well you know no no no, yeah, no no that's that's what what happened um and it was sort of tolerated not quite sure why but west germany would also specifically send signals across so we mm. could pick it up um and so I guess my favorite programs would have probably always been West German programs because we didn't watch all that much East German television. There were some some films um, and some programs that were quite nice. I can't totally remember them now. But I think as kids we always watched West yeah. German television. Yeah. You must have been a fan of the Sand Mansion. Oh, that's early... true. That's true. Yes, 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 yes. Sand Mansion. And in fact, my children now, when we go to Germany, they, they've outgrown it. But when they were little, at seven o'clock every night, we would sit down and watch the Sand Mansion. Brilliant, brilliant. It was it was magic roundabout in the UK, I think. Yes, we sat yeah, down that, to, that was but... our equivalent. You're right, you're right. <laughs> um so I, I would imagine you were in the uh, the Young Pioneers as well. I was. I was both in the Young Pioneers and the um, later on they were called the Tehrmann Pioneer, I believe. Um, so you started off with a blue neckerchief mm. and then you advanced onto the red one. Um, yeah, it was just, it, it was basically, I mean, unless you were... You came from a family that was very anti-establishment. Mm -hmm. You just joined. It was a matter of course. Yeah. And if you didn't, it came with a lot of problems. So, yeah, I just, yeah. I was part of mm -hmm. that whole movement. And then later on, of course, the Freie Deutsche Jugend, FD, FDJ, FDJ. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I progressed yeah. through the ranks right. of all and, of and that. Did you do any of the military training in the uh, Pioneers? Um, or in the I'm FDJ? not sure we did it as the Pioneers so much. Um, it certainly became a big feature later on when we were in the Free German Youth. Mm. Um, we had, in fact, when we were, when I moved on to do um, my degree course, uh, part of that was always devoted to sort of military training. It was called civil defense, 
Um, but it really was very military. They would stick us away somewhere in a camp where we really had to work under military rules and greet. Then there was some sort of military people there that were overseeing all of that as well at the time. Yeah. They were probably talent spotting for uh, later life, possibly. Possibly, possibly. Although that was uh, that's an altogether different conversation to be had. What was going on in those camps? <laughs> uh, you can't leave that hanging, Ancha. <laughs> oh, it was a very odd experience. Stick a few twenty odd year olds with some of their lecturers because mm. our lecturers would come along with us and. Um, be our trainers there in a camp in the middle of nowhere where you are not allowed to go out for, I don't know, two, three weeks, four weeks possibly. And there was some really very odd goings on. Um, okay. Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll stop there. Yes, possibly. We'll stop there. Possibly. It's a family show. Yes. Um, <laughs> Um, did you have any relatives in the West? Yes, I did. Um, my auntie, my dad's sister, had left in the 50s when it was still possible um, and had established herself in West Germany, was married there and had two children. And uh, I, I remember being about 10 the first time I ever met them, the first time they actually came back. My dad wanted to leave. I mean, it's actually quite a, a coincidence that I'm even here because my dad was going to leave the country and join his sister in West Germany in 61. In the summer of 61, he was going to go camping and not to ever come back. And whilst he was camping, they put the wall up and he just couldn't, he couldn't leave anymore. They had already I had some some position for him in the Bundeswehr, from what I gather, mm. um, but he was stuck. Um, so I was then eventually born in '65. So obviously he he just you know came to the conclusion that there was no way out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, his sister stayed in West Germany, and they didn't come to visit us until yeah, I was about ten. Right. And did they send you gifts as well? Yes, they did. Um, and in fact, my grandmother left in 72 to join her daughter in um, in West Germany, um, which was quite traumatic for me because I, I could never go and visit her after that. The first time I actually went to visit her was after I left in 89. I spent a couple of days over there. Um, she would come and see us occasionally. Um but yes, it um, they would always send the, the they were obviously precious things um, when little parcels arrived from the west with coffee and yeah. chocolate and you know all the little things that they probably bought really cheaply, but we really appreciated. Yeah, no, no, I've I've heard that from other uh, former <laughs> former GDR citizens of the uh, excitement over the packages from, yes. from the west. So your grandmother presumably reached pensionable age, at which point she could then go and live in the west because the east didn't want to then be paying her pension. Well, theory. yes, they, they once you had reached pensionable age, they were quite happy to for you to just take your stuff and leave because as you say you then weren't um, a burden on their pocket any longer okay okay no thanks for that um d presumably you visited east berlin at some point in your childhood yes, quite or? a lot um yeah. well in my childhood yes with my parents occasionally but certainly when i became a student a lot of my friends were from berlin and um i had um i had quite a lot of friends that were um, yeah, we're based in Berlin, and and so I used to go there very regularly. I still have friends there now. And how aware were you of the wall and West Berlin? You know, what what how how did you feel? Of, you know, I'm trying to understand how what you thought about it. Did you just try and put it out of your mind and avoid it? Or? No, we always knew it was there. And it was very strange, especially in Berlin, because you could get relatively close and you could actually glance across. Um, and it was relatively odd to think that there was a world over there that we could just never reach. Um, but in the end... It was just a reality that you lived with. 
Um, when I got older, as I said, when I was a student, <clears throat> used to spend quite a bit of time in Berlin. I had some unusual friends. In fact, one of my friends was from Yemen and he actually kept a Yemeni passport and he was allowed to cross and he we would wait for him wherever we could on the eastern side whenever he came back and we would give him orders for records that we wanted and he would come back with basically what the goodies that we'd ordered from him, but it, he could go, we could see him go, we could see him come back, and yet we could never go where he went. Yeah, it must be a really weird experience. It was that very strange. There's this other almost mythical city yes. right next to you that you just can't get to. Yes, with all the goodies that you could ever want. Yeah. It taught you um, self-restraint, I guess. You always knew that you just couldn't. You would want it, but you couldn't get to it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you never, I mean, did you ever think about, oh, how could I get over there or what? Well, what we made a pact. This whole bunch of friends that we were quite subversive. Um, there was quite a lot of um, people that were religious, and you might have come across this, but the church was almost the unofficial opposition in East Germany. Um, and my boyfriend at the time was. Um, the son of a vicar, but not just your ordinary village vicar, but somebody who was in um, uh, politically engaged mm. and would preach. And he was on very much on the radar of the Stasi, so were all his children. Um, and through that, um, we made a pact <laughs> somewhere, sometime in the mid-80s, we said... We are going to spend New Year's Eve 1990, not 2000, but 1919, under the Eiffel Tower, come what may. Well, we never did, because then it didn't really matter anymore. By then, the wall had come down anyway. But that was the sort of, that was the ambition for us. Yeah, no, that that's really interesting. And <laughs> little did you know that that was <laughs> exactly. actually going to be possible exactly. on that day. Exactly. That's that. That's a great. That's a great story. Um, when when did you 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 talked about being a student? So were you studying in Berlin? No, I studied in Leipzig at the. Um, um, that still exists. It wasn't a university. It was called the Handelshochschule. Um, HHL Leipzig, if you want to look it up, it still exists now. It has got quite a good history of um, economics. I studied economics. Um, it has a very good history of economics. And even during the East German times, it turned out quite um, a well-educated bunch. <clears throat> but it was quite difficult to get into at the time. Um, and yes, I was lucky enough to, to... I wanted to really get into the hotel trade you know, the big world and the yeah. excitement of international trade and international visitors. But there was out of the 10 seminar groups that they would take in every year, there was only two of them that were for the hotel business. And you had to be very, very clean and ideologically on on. Yeah, on, on message, message and, uh, um, yeah. to get in there, and I didn't. And your parents would have to be card you know, very, party very card clean. Holders and, yes, and, and my parents were not members of the SED, the main socialist communist party, mm -hmm. because my dad's background wasn't right because he came from a capitalist family. Um, he then became a member of the NDPD. You have to be careful how you say that, um, which which basically was the pool for all the ex-capitalists that wanted to help build a better Germany. If you yeah. see what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, no, I do, I do understand because I think not people aren't necessarily aware that there were these sort of almost front parties yes. to try and. Uh, give the impression that it was a multi-party state, yet yes. the SED was pulling all the strings. Yes, it was. And they basically 
the 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 uh, the farmers had their own party. Um, then there was the NDBT was basically the the yeah all the intelligentsia used to sort of be in there as well. There was a liberal party LBT. I, I can't totally remember what it was called, but it was a liberal party. I'm not quite sure who they were trying to fit into that particular straitjacket, but yeah. And in fact, my dad's cousin um, became a very High, he became the personal assistant to the leader of the NDBD because all these little parties provided the oh, they were like a second in command to Honecker or whoever was in charge in the Politburo. And he, uh, my dad's cousin, was the personal assistant to one of these guys. And we got quite a lot of stories out of Berlin at times that I think we weren't allowed to repeat. So you can't repeat them now? Well, I can now, but at okay. the time well, I just, couldn't. Just, well, it was just, little things like he would say, oh, they they all lived in this sort of, um, in is it called, was it called Glienicke? Uh, Wandlitz. Uh, Wandlitz. That's yeah. it. They all lived in Wandlitz and all the... Um, the ambassadors also had their local, uh, their their residences there. And my dad's cousin's boss had his residence right next to the um, French ambassador, who one morning decided to put a fountain outside his home. And because it couldn't be that a, a, a Western um, citizen would have a bigger fountain that then the East German neighbor, my relative was dispatched to source a bigger fountain that then ultimately got put into the front garden of right. his boss. So little things like that, which I remember when I heard them, went totally against all this ideological stuff that we were being taught about, the working classes and stuff. And I remember that churning around in my head thinking, well, that's a bit petty. How does that really work out with the working classes and all of that? Yeah. So, yeah, we there was a few of those stories kicking around. Yeah. That's the one I remember right now, yeah. but there was a few others like that. I think you're right. It probably was Glienicke because Van Litz was where all the East German leaders used to live. Yes. And then it was probably diplomatic compound. It was diplomatic compound, that's right. And, I th yeah, it, it was probably Glienicke, if yeah. I remember rightly. Yeah. And... You, you said you studied economics. I yeah. mean, that that must have been with quite a socialist yes, slant. Yes, very, very. Um, so it was very red. Yeah, it was basically nationalise everything and sell well, stuff to the West. Well, they did tell us. That, um, they did. They did give us an idea into Keynes and Adam Smith, and so we did learn about the alternative theories. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and. But we obviously were told that ours was much superior. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so when you you finish your, did you get a degree, an economics I did, degree? Yes, I did. Where, when you finish that, what where did you uh, go to work? Well, I, uh, the system in East Germany was such that in the last year of your uh, studies, they would they would basically because it was all planned. Um, Everybody that had a job, everybody that was studying would also get a job. So the amount of students that were in the year would, this is how many jobs would come to the university or, or to the um, higher education organization, whoever you were studying with. And they would then be distributed. Um, obviously, the first choice of jobs would go to the highest achievers. I had, whilst I had been very good at school, once my parents, or I got out of my parents' house and I was become a little freer, I uh, neglected my studies somewhat and I also didn't quite see the point in some of the stuff that I had to study, which was, as as we just established, very ideolo ideologically coloured. Um, so I wasn't quite in the top tier um, and what I got to pick from was essentially one of the local um, HAOs, which is the uh, which was one of the uh, retail organisations in East Germany. We had Konsum and HAO, um, and and they were 
organized that you had a, a local center um, and they were looking for somebody, I can't even remember what the job was meant to be, but somewhere locally they were looking for somebody to help them with something. And I took the job, but by then I had already met my then my my husband to be, and I knew I wasn't going to work there. And it it sort of oh, it sent me down a real rabbit hole of of worries, and I didn't really know how to address it. I didn't want them to think that I was coming, and then be disappointed that I wasn't going to come. They're going to had they had to find me a flat. I even had to go through the motions of viewing flats and approving them and in the end I actually rang the boss there and said look I'm going to tell you something now that I, I'm sure I shouldn't be telling you but I am not going to start with you because I'm going to get married and I'm going to move to Britain. Okay which uh, brings us <laughs> on to um, one of the reasons I, I f found your story interesting although what you've just told me is equally um, fascinating detail as well. So, um, how did you meet your future husband? Right. I was at um, college in Leipzig and I was, I came home for one of the, uh, the, the study holidays and in the next, I come from a very rural area and the next village from where my parents lived um, had the uh, head office of um, the hosiery industry in East Germany. Um, and they would buy in equipment, um, in this case sewing machines, um, from the, um, from the West, because obviously the East couldn't provide it. And with the equipment came the engineers that would install it. And usually they were kept under very close observation they weren't really allowed to mingle too much and i don't really to this day understand what happened but these two english guys turned up locally and they were allowed to just go to local discos and I, I, it was obviously much excitement amongst everybody um and yeah so i met tim um he didn't speak any i i managed to my english was probably better than most of the local, um, most of the other local girls, so I had a, a competitive so, advantage. Oh, <laughs> always good, always good. <laughs> and yeah, so and we we eventually had you know started some something like a relationship, um, and he asked me to marry him very early on. But I think he wanted he, he asked me to marry him because he wanted to get me out of the country. He felt sorry for me. And I said, no, no, I'm going to finish my studies. If you're still hanging around for that long, then we can consider it after that. And um, so we had a long distance relationship in a way. Um, he, would he would come back um, and we had to sort of be quite subversive because I didn't want to um, have any problems at university. Um, so he would just get invitations from people I vaguely knew that didn't have much to lose and never really stay with them. And I'm sure the local Stasi people knew what was going on, but somehow yeah. we went through the whole charades. He did actually book into a hotel the first time he came back. Um, so, yeah, he would come back and visit me um, regularly and we would sometimes meet in Hungary or in the Czech Republic and you know, could be on holiday together. Yeah. But we could never go there together or leave together. Yeah. He could drop me to the border mm. and then I had to cross mm. my way and he had to go his way. So when when did you first meet him? What year was that? Um, 86, I think. Okay. And um, um, what did you like about him? Well, he was English, I mean. <laughs> 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 um, well, it, it was... I, I've always been a bit of an adventurer in my days. I, I, and he was just the most exciting thing ever. Um, but he was also very handsome and he was a proper gentleman and he was just very different to anybody I had ever met before. Yeah. He was tall and, um, and he traveled a lot because he would not just install, um, machinery in East Germany. He went frequently to South America and, 
he was all over the place, Switzerland, yeah. and I would always get postcards from wherever he was. Yeah. Well, the Stasi must have definitely been they on your... They must have known, yeah. On, on yeah. Unfortunately, my Stasi files, because I moved to England um, before, the war, uh, before East Germany was dissolved, in a way, um, my files came to the German embassy, and they still had enough time to shred everything. And they did actually send us a letter in 1990 saying... Assuming your something along the lines, assuming your um, your agreement, we have gotten rid of all your files. And right. at the time, I remember thinking, yeah, "All right then." But what I didn't realize was that they had basically gotten rid of all so my ba Stasi files. So basically, your file was transferred to yeah. the East German Embassy in the UK. That's right. Yeah, and that's what they must have done with any East German citizen yes. that, that moved to the UK. I was number thirty-five. I was the 35th East Germany in the UK, apparently. Wow. That that few. I would have thought there'd be more than that. No, but when I got here, because they would also do um, Christmas parties at the East German embassy, which was basically just their way of checking in with everyone. Um, but, you know, if you get an invite to your, Chris, or to your embassy's Christmas party, you don't refuse. Um, so yeah, I, I still got one invitation to the Christmas party 89 at the East German Embassy in Belgrave Square. And, um, there we talked and there was every East German in the UK was invited. Not everybody turned up because a few of them lived in Scotland, but there was actually somebody who came down from Scotland for it. Um, and I was told then that I was number 35. Right, right. In, in, Interesting. So these East German citizens still felt a loyalty to East Germany? To turn up for something like that, they must have <coughs> felt, well, felt something. Well, of course. You always feel a loyalty towards the country you were born in, educated in and grew up in. Um, even if you despise it, there is an element of it's your it's familiarity. It's, it's what you know. It's... And... and you know, and, and once you are in London, you know that you're quite free and you can come in there and you can leave again. And that, in fact, if people would have been able to come and go as they please, they probably would have lost a few more. But people wouldn't have wanted the whole country to yeah. go yeah. wholesale, I think. Yeah, you might have been number three million and thirty five if uh, true, if if if, true. They'd, if they'd allowed that. I mean, what? Was that really the only contact that the East German Embassy insisted on having with you once you'd moved to Well, they couldn't the really insist on anything anymore. Um, that also dawned on me much later on. Um, I, mean, I still had an East German passport. So this was obviously, I was still, you know, I was very much still officially East German. But they told me when they handed me the passport in East Germany before I left, mm. Um, that I should go to the West Germ, uh, sorry, to the East German Embassy in London to register myself. I didn't know that I didn't really have to do that, but it was so entrenched in me oh, yeah, that yeah. I, I yeah. just couldn't even imagine not doing it. And yeah. so I did, and I registered myself. And so that's how they kept a bit of a an eye on you. I yeah. Guess. Yeah. Okay. No, that that that's that's a really interesting. Um, insight there but we have sort of jumped ahead a bit because obviously you start this relationship with Tim in 86 it's long distance he has to go away you're still in East Germany he's sending you letters he's he's writing to you yeah and then you decide to get married yes uh, yes true um I basically went to the equivalent of the citizens advice bureau in Leipzig at the time <laughs> How naive of me um, to inquire what I would need to do. And I was absolutely terrified because I thought any minute now they're really just going to take me away. Yeah, and the guys in the leather jackets the, yes, are going to turn up. Yeah, in the max they would turn up. Nobody ever did, funnily enough. Um, but the guy didn't really, whoever I saw at the time, didn't really give me any real advice. Um but I made an, I also went to the 
with Tim to the British Embassy. That was another terrifying moment because I thought, oh, the the men in the Max because mm. they hang they hung around all the. You mean in Berlin? In Berlin. In Berlin, the British. The British mission, or because like, it wasn't an official embassy. No, was it was it? probably just yeah, a mission yeah. in Ber- yeah. in Berlin, in okay. East Berlin. Yeah. And that was another terrifying moment because I thought, I'm sure I'm not allowed to do this. But anyway, I did. And they gave some advice. And I remember walking in there, seeing the picture of the Queen and thinking how very quaint. (laughs) Um, Did we offer you tea? You must have done. (laughs) I can't imagine that you didn't. But um, I probably would have refused it because tea to this day is not quite my drink. Um. But, yeah, so I I remember being very excited over the fact that I had actually set foot on British soil, effectively. So, yes, we did. We made inquiries, um, always being slightly worried that something might happen, but nothing ever really did. What you had to do um, was you had to apply for uh, marriage to a West, Western citizen. They had just reduced the period of time it would take to get a response from six months to three months um, when we did and that was in early 89 I finished my studies in in the March of 80 no probably January 89 and I then immediately applied and um, got a response within three months Um, but you weren't allowed to book um, an actual um, a date for your in in any of the the registry offices because we had to get married in a local registry office, but you weren't and dates were like gold dust. I don't know why they didn't give enough of them out evidently, and you had to book them well in advance. But because I had to wait for my um for my response, I I did quite sneakily. Uh, book the date provisionally. I had to bribe some people. <laughs> I was working temporarily in a, just a local shop. And as you well know, East Germany was always short of everything. Um, tomato ketchup was a big one. And when we got a delivery of tomato ketchup in my local shop, I kept a few bottles to one side to then bribe the registrar to give me a date without officially giving me a date. That's brilliant. That's brilliant. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I got my date before I got the yes, but I got the yes that I could go ahead. We got married on the 4th of July, 89. I, um, I'm i sorry, I was just going to ask you, did you meet Tim's parents before then? Oh, yes, they did come over. Much, oh, God, my mum will still tell you about the traumatic experience that was. Oh, we'll have to get your mum on. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't speak English. No, That's no, 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 no. <laughs> well, tell me the story. Well, um, Tim was one of four, um, and his entire, and we did live by then. We had moved out of the flat that I was telling you earlier. They had to give us adequate, or they had to give us a living space that was the similar size to what we had before and because we had a relatively big uh, flat, we got offered for very little money to move into a detached house, which was lovely. In 1930s built, it had actually belonged to a family member of mine who had passed away. Beautiful house. Um, And we moved in there, so we had quite a lot of space. And when um, we felt that we needed to get the families together and Tim was very my parents are very German everything has to be just so and Tim's family was very oh yeah you know his mum is half Spanish and it was all a bit yeah we all sort this out don't worry about it and they turned up a lot of them and they all camped out in our house and my mum nearly lost the will to live she couldn't really communicate with them they would make a mess in the bathroom every morning (laughs) She will still tell you if you would, um, if your German was good enough and you would ask her about it, she will still tell you what what my daughter put me through. Um, yeah, so that was, they were only there for about four days, but my mum was very much on the verge of a yeah. mental breakdown. She was traumatized she was. By, their, by their visit. Okay, she so was. so let, let's go back to the wedding. So it's a uh, registry office in Berlin, was this? No, or, no, or it this was a was local registry local. office. Local registry office. I 
was not going to get married in white. Um, I, for some reason, had it in my head I was going to get married in red. We then suggested to all of the visitors, including Tim's family, all the British visitors, including his family, that this was a condition um, that if you wanted to get married to a Westerner, it had to be in red, <laughs> which is obviously not true, but they all... <laughs> <laughs> Oddly enough, they all believed it. <laughs> so, yeah, I got married in red um, with a hat that came from the local market in High Wycombe, from what I gather. Um, oh, this gets better all the time. <laughs> and, yeah. I know. I looked fabulous. Um, and, yeah, so we just, we had his, oh, my, my, the one thing, the one, the one odd, well, the one unusual thing about it was, as well as everything else. Um, my brother had by then joined, had been conscripted into the army. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't allowed out only for very special occasions. And getting, your sister getting married was a special occasion. However, your sister getting married to an Englishman was not a special occasion. <laughs> so we had to have, because my mum was the secretary to the mayor who would have to vouch for him, he actually wrote to the army saying, can you let this young man out? And he omitted to tell them that it was a marriage to an English guy. And I think communication wasn't quite up to scratch on that one. They let my brother out mm. for the wedding. Um, but we all we were all basically told that we had to keep very quiet because he could get into all sorts of trouble for this because he was basically contact with the enemy i guess at the yeah, time yeah absolutely um, absolutely so yeah that was uh, we did get him out he was there yeah um and we got married and um spent our wedding night in chemnitz or what used to be karl Marxstadt. yeah in a hotel hotel moscow oddly enough in yeah. karl Marxstadt. it sounds so romantic <laughs> Doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, the Hotel yeah. Moscow in Karl Marx. I'll <laughs> That's have to. What it I'll, was. I'll have to look that one up. Um, so, how soon after the wedding did you leave the GDR? I then had to go through. Le so this was in July eighty nine, and whilst there was already quite a lot of um, signs that this wasn't going well, and. Um, Hungary had opened their borders to Austria and quite a few people were escaping. Um, we still, I still had to go through the official paperwork um, to leave East Germany. So that was my first step. I had to get an exit visa out of East Germany. And for that, I had to have, there was a checklist. I had to have every utility company that I'd ever been somehow in contact with and they had to sign me off that I didn't owe them anything. This was quite clearly just a way of making this whole process very difficult. And you had to turn up in, in, in person and they were really horrible to you. But so I got that. Then you had to list everything you wanted to take. You had to list. Um, and it had to be in five copies. These were the days before. Well, I guess West Germany had photocopying, yeah. but East Germany was still very much working on uh, carbon paper. Carbon paper. Yeah. And, and I had to type everything out on a conventional typewriter on carbon copy. Um, and anything that I wanted to take that could have been of cultural value had to be given to somebody that was officially able to sign it off and say she can take that and did you have anything of cultural value well i did yeah because my parents had quite a few antiques and i had been given by my grandmother when she passed away um and other members of the family some antique bits and pieces that are that were in my possession um i had to basically take them somewhere who a person who had to sign it off and say, yeah, that's fine to take out. And also books, any old books over, I can't remember, anything that was over 50 years old, I had to actually take to somebody to say, no, it's not a first edition, she can take it. Right, right. So in that, that paperwork had to be with me as well. So I had to list everything, um, wait for the exit visa. Then I had to apply for transit visas through because my husband 
was coming to pick me up mm. in the car. So I needed transit visas through uh, Belgium and France, and I needed an entrance visa into Britain. So I had to apply for them. Um, yeah, and eventually I got all the paperwork together, and we left on with a. He came <laughs> with an old Astra, and a, a trailer on the back. So a Vauxhall Astra with a trailer on the that's back. That's it. That's how I left East Germany in style. Cool. Um, <laughs> um, Can you just take me through that day and and how you felt that day? Presumably, you were just more than excited that that. You were leaving, or or were yes. you worried about you know losing contact with relatives and things? like I that? I was mainly excited. I was twenty three years old. Um, I could. I got out of this country. I was actually going to cross that border that seemed uncrossable all my lifetime. Um, I was going to see London, which was like unbelievable at the time. Um, so yes, I was very excited. My parents were very sad, obviously, but I guess I had been quite awkward. They were probably, to some extent, a little bit glad to see the back of me. Yeah, you're um, you're his problem now. <laughs> yeah, a little bit like that. I was most sad to leave my brother. Um, I remember saying goodbye to them in front of the house, and I sort of it was very a very quick goodbye to my parents. Although my dad who didn't show emotions particularly easily. He gave me a um, a good good luck uh, charm, and he said, look after it. Um, yeah, and I found my brother most difficult to say goodbye to, um, and then off we went. And then we weren't going straight to the UK. We were going to come past my grandmothers, who, as I said, I, I had never visited yeah. before. Um, so I spent the next three days with my grandmother in um, North Rhine-Westfalen. Um, and yeah, so, yeah, that was quite a, I remember actually as we crossed the border, we got to the border, they looked at my paperwork, they never even took five copies, I was most put out by that. <laughs> I felt like saying, take them, I have spent hours doing these. But they took one glance at them, Waved us through, gave me, gave us our stamps, um, and then I arrived on the West German side, and they just waved us through. And then there was like a um, a petrol station, and I could just go in there, and there was all this stuff that I had never seen in a shop, and it was quite quite odd. Yeah, it must have been. I mean, I'd, I've sort of heard others sort of mention it, it was almost a bit like a sensory overload in terms of the colors and the choice yes it was it's colors and choices i i do remember um thinking that it's just too much choice not on this that was just a petrol station but as i then came to, especially to britain and i saw the big tescos i i remember thinking who needs this much coffee or these many varieties of it i, I still ask that question myself to be <laughs> true, honest true so, um, yeah, and then I spent a, a few days with my grandmother, and then we set off. Um, again, we then went via Mönchengladbach, because Tim's cousin was actually stationed with the forces in Mönchengladbach. Um, spent a few hours there, and then set off on our way. This was on the 9th of November, 89. Set off on our no, that way. That date sounds familiar. Doesn't it? Yes. But we still didn't know that this was going to happen. Still, nobody in the morning knew what was going to happen that evening. So I remember actually uh, reading the supplement to the Sunday Times in Mönchengladbach because we weren't the forces. Um, and it, on the front cover it, um, of the magazine, there was a big picture of Karl Marx. And at the bottom it said RIP. And I remember asking, what yeah. does RIP mean? And I was explained that this means rest in peace. So the writing was on the wall. Um, but... We took off, we, we were exhausted by then, but um, we took off through Belgium and it was quite late by then and we were listening to the World Service in the, in the car and um, just before, about 20 minutes before we crossed over or we, we reached the French border, they announced in the, on the World Service that they had opened the crossings in, in Berlin, that the wall had come down. And what? 
How, how did you feel about that? I don't know. It was just, I couldn't believe it. And for me, oddly enough, the main reaction was, God, I went through all this hassle <laughs> and I could have just walked through three days later. Yeah. It was just mainly, really? Yeah. Now? Yeah. And, um, and Tim was a bit annoyed. He said, we've missed the biggest party in Europe by a few days. Um, so, yeah, it was... Yeah. And, and then we reached, 20 minutes later, we reached the French border and I needed all my, um, all my uh, paperwork be stamped and they needed to see my visa. And so I had to actually go and show my passport. And the guy, the French border guard, looked at my passport and he couldn't believe it. And he just said words to the extent of, wow, you were quick. Because they, they had obviously just heard yeah, what yeah. was going on and 20 yeah. minutes later he saw his first East German passport yeah. there. Yeah. He wanted to keep it as a souvenir, but I said, no, I still need yeah. it. Yeah. Did you not think, hmm, I'm going to have to go and be under the Eiffel Tower in 1990 <laughs> New Year's Eve? <laughs> no, it had sort of, I think we all sort of knew that that probably went out of the window at that point. We Once it wasn't, once it was easily achieved, it didn't become an issue any it longer. Wasn't the challenge no, it that wasn't you'd, the challenge that you'd set right. before. That's right. um, and so how, how soon did you get reunited with, with your family? Well, we went back for Christmas. Um, so we left early November. Um, and it was always, the idea was always that I was going to go back for Christmas. Um, however, because the time frame was very tight and because Tim had to apply for visas every time um and i had to get an because i had, didn't have a multiple entry visa into britain um i had to get an exit visa and a re-entrance visa and and it all became too much for me in the end i just went to the west german embassy in london and i said because west germany had never recognized east german citizenship as such so i just walked into the the embassy in belgrave square and i said can you just issue me with a West German passport and they lectured me at the time I remember this was still you still got quite personal um, service there now it's it's a it's a conveyor belt but then um, they took me into a room and said we have to tell you that this is Ill illegal under your law and I just looked at them and I said I think they've got other problems at the moment <laughs> and they laughed and said yeah you're probably right so I ended up I basically Tim and his brother, who came with us, left without having a visa and just thinking, oh, it will be fine. And I went with two passports. I basically used my West German passport to get through Belgium, France, and out of Britain. Mm. Um, and, um, and then I just used the East German passport when I approached the East German border. And when we approached the East German border for that Christmas, I was really, really nervous because I thought, I've got a West German passport in this car. If they search us, I'm in trouble. Um, but they were so relaxed. At that point, everything had already, you know, sort of, they let it all hang loose. And, yeah. and Tim didn't have a visa and they let him through. Yeah. Which was unthinkable six months before. Yeah. Um, and they just went, oh, yeah, whatever. Yeah. Seems to be open for everybody now, so yeah, yeah, just go. Yeah. Um. So yeah, we. I saw my family that Christmas. Yeah, that must have been quite emotional because you, you know, the the whole fact that they could now come and visit you in London and it, it was odd. Yeah, I don't. It was my the first people or the first person that did come to visit me was my brother that that spring, and if you look up, um, the May of 1990 was very hot. And my brother turned up thinking this was going to be foggy and horrible English weather. With all his thick clothes, he had to go and buy uh, shorts. And we went down yeah. to Brighton and he couldn't believe it. Yeah. So yeah. that was the first person that came and visited yeah. me. Wow. Wow. And was he still in the MVA? No, then? he was gone. By, he he, was, yeah. Cause they they had, he, had early, he had an early discharge as well because he was actually quite worried because he was in, in the army, in the NVA, as you say, um, during the uh, demonstrations, the Monday demonstrations, um, and they had been mobilized. Um, and he was close to Leipzig where the Monday demonstrations started. Um, and 
his unit was on high alert and he i remember him saying what if they actually mobilize us because under normal circumstances i would be on that side of the fence and i can't see myself shooting or doing anything yeah. he was really quite scared um but then when it all had come about and um the wall had come down he enjoyed a very very free army life um and he got um he 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 left i think they got um disbanded after a year which usually would have been 18 months but he left after a year and that was it yeah so yeah well that that's just an amazing story that you that you've just told me which i'm sure um our listeners will be really interested in i just have two more questions Go for it. you which are what what are your fondest memories of the GDR? Um, I I think there was the, the the security blanket that we all did have. Um, when I first arrived in England, uh, we were actually quite poor. We hardly ever, we, we hardly had the money to pay for our rent on a monthly basis. I didn't have a job. And I remember thinking, doesn't anybody care? And there was this, this sudden feeling, yes, you're free, but nobody actually cares anymore either. Because there was an element of, you felt important when you knew that people were listening to you all the time. That made you, that gave you a certain feeling of, People actually care what you think. And I think with hindsight, that was an odd feeling of security. Um, that might sound a bit bizarre, but... I, I, I don't think so. I think, you know, you knew that you were going to get a job. You knew you were going to get a wage. There would be somewhere to live. Yeah, um, there was never this existential fear that maybe if you didn't get a paycheck next month, the whole thing might be going downhill. Yeah, yeah, no, ab absolutely. So what was the worst thing about living in the GDR, would you say? Having to watch what you were saying, and where you, there is a, a, another story of a friend. Um, I, I was very, I came very close to experiencing what it meant to be on the wrong side of the political law, if you want. Um, when I was 18, I had my best friend was who was 19. Her parents applied to leave for the West, and um, she was already an adult, but she had a younger sister who was 13. Um, and there was obviously all sorts of problems with that initially. But um, her dad one day was ordered into the Ministry of Interior, which was never a good thing. Um, and her mum went with him. I guess she regretted that for the rest of her life, but they never came back. They were basically imprisoned. Um, they were, there was a, a trial, and, and I was sort of very close to my friend, and she then had to manage herself, her sister, and eventually her parents' release as well. For a 19-year-old, that was a, quite a, a tough thing to do. Um, and this fear... Off, something could happen to you if you don't tow the line. I think that's probably the worst thing that I experienced. And I think that that's a very good contrast to what you said about the, you know, the the fondest memory of yes. of, of the GDR that there was that double edged sword yes. that every citizen had to deal with. Yeah, Ansha, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you i really appreciate you sharing your your story with us and i hope being on cold war conversations wasn't uh, too bad for you thank you for listening to me and uh, pleasure was all mine thank you take care well i hope you enjoyed that story of the cold war i found that really interesting and a and a different angle that i hadn't expected at all if you'd like to see photos of Ancha's wedding, then head over to our show notes, which are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 82. 
This will also show as a link in some podcast apps. Don't forget, if you'd like to get that sought-after Cold War Conversations coaster and help keep us on the air, then head over to patreon.com slash coldwarpod, or again, click on the link in your podcast app. And if you can't wait for the next episode, do visit our Facebook discussion group where our guests and listeners, just like you, continue the Cold War conversation. Just search Cold War Conversations in Facebook. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. Goodbye.